Okay, then we don't have a video, but we have our host speaker, Stefan Knod. He's a director of digital ventures at Wurzilla. And he wants to introduce himself. Yes. Uh, thanks a lot for, for being here and having the chance for uh, heading the panel on emission reduction. Um, yeah, being from Wertzle, I'm very happy also to support the CDEFCON. Uh, at Wertzle, we are uh, in charge of also startup collaboration. Um, and so also uh, this topic and uh, how we deal with emissions is quite important for us. Um, on the panel, I would like to introduce for the beginning Malte Siegert, uh, Head of Environmental Politics from the NABU in Hamburg. Eduardo Panciera, a Managing Director from Ionada, a startup from Canada uh, for um, scrubber technologies. Jan Will Olaf Willems from uh, ZDM Norway, um, co-founder and early stage investor in battery technologies. Johanna Frecki, Innovation Director Marine Solutions from Wertzle. And Laura Jakobsen, uh, Senior Digital Specialist from Most Tankers in Denmark. Welcome to the panel. Um, <laughs> so please uh, come to stage. Please start Malte Siegert with the first presentation. Yes, hello. Um, thanks to Carsten, first of all, for the invitation, for the opportunity to, sp to speak to you today. Uh, I will give a brief introduction about the problem. What is the issue about air pollution? We have had a lot of challenges today already ship breaking and uh, human rights and whatever. So you can see that uh, related to shipping, there are a lot of challenges uh, indeed. And one further one is uh, the, uh, the issue of air pollution. Um, probably just to give you a brief introduction what I'm working on and who am I from. I'm from NABU. It's a um, German, or the largest German NGO with uh, around about 650,000 members. Uh, and uh, we have 16 offices in all federal states here in Germany, and I'm working for the federal office here in Hamburg. We are also we are working on various issues, but one uh, of the issues is transport uh, and especially shipping, and we have um, uh, been running uh, various uh, projects uh, throughout the last years. And as you can see, we uh, are addressing the cruise line industry, we are addressing the container ship or the, um, the container ship industry, the government vessels, because government vessels uh, or government is not doing a lot on their own vessels as well. We have the HFO3 Arctic project running. Uh, we are doing a citizen science project, which we are just starting to install NOx um, uh, emission uh, um, um, uh, counters actually here on the North Shore of the River Elbe. And we have a project uh, been running for three years, which was called Cleaner in Ports. And there we looked at emissions from ports because you have a lot of emissions from terminals, from the hinterland um, uh, combustion, and as well as from the ships. So that's uh, mainly the background, all those issues I'm uh, dealing with. And uh, why ACT? Um, we have two major pollutants. We have uh, climate pollutants. As you know, it's uh, carbon dioxide. And uh, methane, uh, that is uh, relevant uh, now a little bit more because the shipping industry is um, actually starting to use LNG, liquefied natural gas, more for shipping. That's very good in terms of uh, air pollutants, which I will show you a little later. Uh, but it's difficult in, uh, um, uh, concerning the uh, methane because uh, methane is 30 times more radical than CO2. And if you have it from fracking, from American fracking, you have it uh, in the... Uh, supply chain and you have as, as well in the pr uh, combustion process and uh, so if we would have an increase uh, of LNG uh, worldwide uh, then the targets of the IMO um, the reduction uh, of CO2 by 50 50 by 50 percent might not be reached if we have an increase a major increase of LNG so it's um, really uh, quite challenging this is uh, climate pollutants and we have air emissions uh, these are the main ones what we are dealing with actually and which are the biggest burdens also for health issues and also for the environment. Um, climate is also a big issue because you have uh, particles and uh, especially there where you have shipping close to Arctic uh, areas, then the uh, particles are covering the ice, the ice gets black and then the sunlight is not uh, reflected anymore but it's absorbed and so meanwhile 
the particles from, uh, and especially the soot, the carbon from shipping is the second biggest driver for climate change after CO2. So you also have to have a look on that. Environmental damage, um, does, um, uh, especially NOx, uh, does um, damage to soils, uh, acidification of soils, damage to plant vegetation, all that. And uh, a third major issue is health, uh, and all these climate pollutants does, uh, do a lot to, your, uh, to the health systems, cardiovascular disease, asthma, bronchitis, cancer, asthma. So um, you have especially the particles, the ultrafine particles, from, uh, which are part of the suit. Uh, they are going uh, through the nose and then through the lung and then from there into the blood system and from there to the heart and to the head, and it's going into the brain. And there has been a study in... Mexico, where um, uh, it could have been proven that there is a relation between those uh, emissions and the special particles coming from street-related traffic and Alzheimer. So you can uh, at, at least uh, think about that uh, um, uh, difficulty, too, uh, in terms of the enormous emissions which you have from shipping and in the EU. Uh, there has been a study that we have 50,000 people dying primarily from uh, emissions from ships in Europe, uh, and it's not only in ports, but it's also in long coastlines, all there where we have a lot of traffic. This is just one example for, um, uh, for the question, where is particulate matter in, uh, uh, in international waters? And you can see it's always along, here's China, here you have all the production sites, and then the international shipping is going here via India, Suez Canal, in the Mediterranean Sea and up to the North Sea. And there you can really see that the biggest impacts for PM uh, 2.5 in this respect, uh, but also from NOx and for all the other pollutants, are mainly along bigger coastlines and in the big international ports, also here in Northern Europe. And I would like to show to you just a short um, uh, animation for uh, Hamburg, which has been made by a company who is mainly dealing with uh, climate issues and with weather, uh, René Hommel, he's also here sitting in the audience. If you have questions later on to this modeling, you can also ask him, uh, and uh, Carsten will uh, try to start this presentation. And it's just to show what kind of local impact we have from emissions. This is mainly gases here. What we can see is CO2 and it's uh, NOx and it's sulfur. And it's a mix, and there you can see how um, uh, the clouds, which are emitted from ships in this aspect, um, are, um, uh, are, have a direct local impact. And it's uh, a square of 10 kilometers per 10 kilometers. And then you can really see how much that is actually doing. Because the problem is that we um, hardly can see the emissions uh, or feel the emissions with our senses. We might smell them but usually we don't see them and we cannot uh, tackle them with any other kind of sense we have, but the impact is enormous. And if you see that um, uh, not only for the port of Hamburg, we have a cause of uh, around about 10,000 ships per year. And uh, there it's just uh, from a few ships. And if you imagine that we have like seven, eight container ships uh, at birth at the same time as we have big cruise vessels coming into the city, then the impact of all these various emissions on the local community is enormous. And I think uh, air pollution is one of the most underestimated problems of our times, and uh, that's the reason why I was happy to speak to you. And um, I think I leave it here, and we can talk about the other issues a little later on. And I think, uh, Carsten, you can stop the presentation and... Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Maite. Please, Eduardo. Okay, good. Thank you. My name is Eduardo Panzer, Managing Director of Ionata BV. We're a clean technology company. We manufacture exhaust gas cleaning systems, also known as scrubbers, that help reduce pollutants. We focus on sulfur dioxide, nitric oxide, as well as carbon capture. My background is a mechanical engineer. I spent 20 years in automotive engineering, reducing emissions. 
There was no marine emissions technology 20 years ago. We did a lot to remove sulfur dioxide from road and rail. And today, 98% of the sulfur dioxides in coastal cities, such as Hamburg and Rotterdam, come from ships. The shipping industry, since 1978, has had 40 years to prepare. And to be frank, they've done very little. The industry emits 500 million tons of carbon dioxide per year. If shipping were a country, they'd be the fifth largest polluter in the world. So coming up with mitigation technologies is essential if we're to bring shipping into the modern world. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Eduardo. Uh, Jan Olaf, would you like to present? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jana Willems. I was educated uh, actually in Switzerland, but I'm Norwegian, where there was not much ocean activity, but I worked there on deep sea mining. And I ended up at, at the end of the MIT, where I was a naval arch architect, so I learned the rest here before I came to Norway. I've been in the oil industry quite for a long time until I saw the light and see maybe you can do something else. And I've been involved basically as an investor and as a uh, seed capital provided to different companies in the environmental field. This one here we started a year, some years ago called ZEM, which stands for Zero Emission Marine. And basically we started actually as a consultant for some large car companies who said, we are the first producing batteries uh, for cars. It's a Japanese car, uh, and which was uh, quite the first pioneer. And they asked, what happened with those batteries after seven, eight years? Around 2015, 16, we'll have many batteries for the second life opportunities. We did some studies for them, and we actually found out the key is to find out what happens with the battery of a life. What is happens is uh, the way you use it. As we have our head, our head office at the DNVGL, we still have our head office there. Uh, GNVGL challenged us, and the CEO of, GO, of DNVGL said, listen, you should really look at what's that, what you can do with batteries and ships. I told him, listen, a super tanker driven by batteries, that doesn't work. But he convinced me very, very quickly that, yes, there are many interesting opportunities. And we actually did those models, finding out what kind of batteries would fit to what kind of purpose. And there are quite many different batteries. So we developed, together with the University of Aachen here, uh, a very um, substantial model to see what happens with batteries the way we use it over time. And we've done that since several years as consultant until uh, some four years ago, one of the ship owners said, can't you stop talking? Can't you just do it? You tell them and that what they should do. And then we said, OK, we can try to put things together. And the last year, we are now uh, actually the second or third largest provider of batteries to ships in Norway. Uh, we uh, do different things. It was an uh, offshore supplier company who said, I would like to really reduce my emissions. Can I do it with batteries? And we said yes, but obviously in the hybrid version where you actually cut your, uh, your variation and you, you, you operate your, your diesel oil, in this case even an LNG engine, at an at a optimal speed, 70-80%, and you use the battery, charge the battery and use all the variation for dynamic positioning and so on with the battery. And that actually has uh, reduced his consumption of uh, fuels by 30%. So just thinking through the system and looking at the whole system is extremely important. Today there is a big market because finally the oil companies said, I'm only accepting offers by supply vessel companies who have hybrid solutions. So now the idea to really put everything in one container, be able to put it quite quickly on the ship so that the ship doesn't lose more than a week's time when it's in harbor anyway for a refitting or upgrading, getting out, that's the big booming business today in, in, uh, in Scandinavia. And the main thing was that the oil company had to say, I want to have it. Second one is uh, one of the, of the big uh, drilling ship companies, actually the biggest in the world, came to us and said, is it possible to actually do heave compensation with batteries? Because basically on a drill ship, you have to lift and reduce the whole 
many hundred tons heavy drilling equipment as the wave go up and down. It's only two, three meters, but nevertheless, if you have to lift several hundred tons up and seven and a half seconds later get it down again, you use incredible energy. So we developed together with the French authorities and the CEA, which is the French Research Center in Grenoble, a uh, extremely high battery system, which you can actually compensate and recuperate up to 85% of what er energy you use to lift the drill string up in order to lower it down again. Because the drills, as, as an oil man, I know the drilling has been on this centimeter exactly at the bottom of the sea. The third one, and that's the one which excites me the most at the moment, is uh, we looked at where can we find very good batteries which are very reliable. And we went around and said, uh, Tesla is great. We had the discussion with Tesla, but they're not good enough because they're not really used many thousands of time. Buses are, trucks are. So we looked at the three biggest uh, battery producer for trucks, and we found out actually a German company called Akasol is providing now all the batteries for Volvo and for Daimler for buses. So we made a deal with them and said, let them marinize it, and we put it as a modular system in ships, both in, uh, in uh, tender vessels and also in, uh, in, uh, in free-floating, uh, free, free-for lifeboats. And just about six months ago, we had the first free for life boat, which is approved by the NVGL. And now it falls down 50, 60 meters. It has the same acceleration, I was told, than a Tesla when it hits the, uh, the surface of the water. But it's all by electric. And it, it reduces the cost amazingly. And suddenly now we see the applications for that kind of activity in all the platforms, which is uh, substantial. My main point is, Horses for courses. We really have to understand what batteries can do, what they cannot do, how they should uh, operate, how long they should operate, to be sure that after 10 years they operate as you, you require it for performance. The recycling issue comes up, what happens after 10, 12 years, and we have actually some study groups at the we have what they call is the Maritime Battery Forum, which is initiated by GNVGL, but has quite many members now to see what can we do with batteries at the end of their life, recycling and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan Bullock. <laughs> Johanna, please. Well, good afternoon. I'm uh, Johanna Fracki from uh, Wärtsilä Marine Solutions. Wärtsilä um, is a company providing smart technologies for sustainable societies. And in Marine Solutions, we have uh, the widest product range going all the way from engines to cruise ship entertainment uh, equipment and the widest install base. Um, my background is in computer science. I have been uh, in, the, in this industry only a year and in, in the company. I'm heading the ecosystem innovation team, uh, which is exploring new technologies and new business models for a sustainable future. So, shipping accounts for 90% of world's trade and 3%, close to 3% of the CO2 emissions. So it's a relatively clean mode of transport. But we are aware the 15 largest ships, their emissions equal to all of the 780 million cars in the world. All in all, I have actually, Eduardo, a different figure. Um, according to my information, shipping is emitting 1 billion tons of CO2 per year which equals to the amount Germany is producing every year. And that amount is likely to increase threefold in the next 30 years if the prognosis of the need of transportation is accurate. And that would result of shipping being responsible for 14% of the emissions in the world in a year. Today, pollution is killing one out of six people. And it's not only an impact on our health, but on our, our planet Earth. 
As an example, sea levels have risen already 20 centimeters from the beginning of 20th century, and they are expected to rise 30 centimeters more by 2065. So the climate change is a reality. Authorities are taking actions. There's Par uh, Paris Agreement, IMO's vision of greenhouse gas-free shipping. We have both our authorities, uh, like in Rotterdam and Hong Kong, who are imposing local uh, regulations uh, against emissions. We also can see our customers' customers taking action towards a world of decarbonization. For example, Unilever is imposing internal prices of, on carbon in their production, and they are intro, uh, introducing a, an internal fund to support innovations in decarbonization. The world leaders are talking that we need to have a price on carbon because we have a price on carbon. So what can we do in shipping? Uh, IMO's, IMO study says that we could already reduce 75% of the emissions by the existing technologies, but the ship owners are not incentivized monetary-wise to, to invest in these new technologies. There is an um, opportunity in carbon trading to bridge this gap. <coughs> Carbon trading is a voluntary market where you can show carbon reductions and get a support in investment. In marine industry, Axo Nobel has recently introduced this. They are producing ship paints, and they showed a difference of efficiency before applying their paints. By showing that a difference, they applied uh, for um, approval of gold standard, which is an authorization agency, and now they can get carbon credits. So this carbon credit is a sort of banknote which you can sell when you, have, uh, when you have achieved it. And one carbon credit equals to one ton of CO2 saved. And once generated, you can sell it and invest it, for example, in cleaner technologies. So what does this mean for us? We can link carbon credits to savings of fuel. If we save one ton of heavy fuel, we save a third of ton of carbon um, uh, emissions. Today, the value of a carbon credit is between six and seven dollars, and with that kind of amount, it's not a game changer. However, we are expecting it to increase and when it reaches level of 40 to 50 dollars, then we are talking about a game changer. And by starting this process now, we are getting ready for the future. In Vertila, we are currently in the process of creating the methodology of carbon credits for new builds. Then we will apply the methodology for approval of from gold, and gold standard, and then we will this autumn make a test with a pilot case. Tomorrow, at the C.Con Maritime Hackathon, we are calling for hackers to help us on this way to zero emission shipping and the introduction, introduction of the carbon credit scheme. Um, there's a growing demand and market of dual fuel, dual fuel engines, which are switching between diesel and natural gas. And the natural gas are emitting a much lower level of emissions than diesel. So the task tomorrow is to analyze the data. We are providing from five ships and altogether 18 dual fuel engines from over a period of two years and uh, with their location data to figure out why, where, and when the sw switching is happening from diesel to LNG. And from that insight, we hope to be able to make reductions in emissions and also bring that to the carbon credit scheme in the future. Thank you for the attention. Thanks a lot, Johanna. Laura?
Hi, I'm Laura Jacobson, and I'm a senior digital specialist at Maris Tankers. Maris Tankers is uh, one of the largest in the product tankers, um, providing services to move the energy around the world. I joined Maris Tankers actually just three months ago. Um, they created a new digital innovation team that's looking into creating innovative solutions um, to the problems that exist today. So just in case you didn't know specifically what Maersk Tankers does, um, because maybe most of you know Maersk for the container shipping, um, this is the supply chain here. And you can see that what we're doing is we're moving what's called um, dirty, uh, we're moving clean energy, which means energy that has been um, refined already. So it comes from the refining plants, and then we transport it to a distribution center, which then will take it to um, the end user. So what we are transporting is actually liquid product, which can be fuels and oils, such as soybean oils. Um, and so this could be distributed to a food manufacturer, and they could create products that then you find at your grocery store. So in the digital, I'm here today as a representative of the digital department, and um, the digital department is, is looking for innovation and uh, digital solutions. And we're looking at it in two value chains in our company. One is the cargoes area, and um, one is in the vessels area. So there's three ways in which we work with partners. The first one is we uh, develop MVPs. And um, one of the examples of MP MVPs that we have is a product that's dealing with the, um, the way in which our pool partners can visualize our data. So for an example, we have created a transparent platform in where the pool partners can log on to see the way we are operating their vessels. And this is something that we uh, recently have launched as well. And if you look at how we partner with companies, we look for ways that we can partner together to create new solutions. And in order to do that, we've needed to create um, a way to gather all of our data from different areas. We have a massive amount of data, in fact, probably the most amount of, of uh, vessel voyage uh, data available in this industry, in the tanker industry. And so in order for us to partner with other companies, it's critical that we take that data and put it in one source that is easily accessible by our partners, but is also protected and secure. And the first way we're doing this is we've decided to partner with Clavinus. Clavinus is a dry bulk operator shipping company in Norway, and they've started their process several years ahead of us. And in order for us to be quicker to the market, um, we have decided to partner with them to create our data structure in this manner. And we feel that this is a way that will help us get quicker to the market with, with products that will benefit the industry. Um, there's another type of partnerships that we are doing. And one of them is we've created the first consortium within our tanker industry that we're working right now to achieve on a product, which is a contract uh, collaboration platform. Right now, there's um, not a, uh, the industry maybe has barriers against collaborating. And so we're hoping to break those down by creating new innovative digital solutions that will help us do that. Um, and then investing, we also have investments. We're working with a startup in, uh, out of Boston called Cargo Metrics. And Cargo Metrics is looking at using algorithms to help 
us to look at how the market is. And we are creating a simulator that's unofficially called Sim Tankers, where the chartering departments can position their vessels around the world and see what the economic value of, of doing that is. So this is a little bit about what we're trying to do um, technologically to create new innovation in the industry. And I look forward to discussing more of what we're doing on the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, thanks a lot to all panelists for, uh, for all the introductions. And I uh, see that there are a lot of similarities, and you have also addressed uh, common topics. Um, Malta, in, in your introduction, you uh, gave a good overview about the impact uh, air pollution already has for, for ports, uh, how you can, can see the vessels moving in, into that area and, and how it takes over time. Um, and also mentioning uh, the, the, proac the project uh, Green Ports. So um, if, if you take uh, maritime pollution in the context of ports, what is the status here in Europe uh, and how we compare to the global ports? Well, the interesting thing is that at least in Europe we have a completely different regulation and legislation in terms of street-related uh, traffic and pollution and that we have uh, on the water side. And it's interesting because we have the River Elbe on one side and we have a street right next to it and the regulation is completely different. The only thing which is addressed in the international shipping is sulfur. And sulfur only there where you have sulfur emission control areas and in the American... Uh, on the American uh, coastlines, you have a different regulation as, as well, in addition with, uh, with uh, nitrogen. But in our part, or most other parts of the world, you don't have regulation at all. And in Europe, you at least have a, uh, a sulfur is addressed. But you don't have any uh, regulation for nitrogen oxides or for particulate matter. On the street level, you do. Although it has been acknowledged that air pollutants are uh, harmful for, uh, uh, for human health. And that is one thing what we don't understand at all, where we say we have to, we have to get faster uh, also in terms of regulation. Now the problem is that we have international regulation, which is done by the IMO, by the International Maritime Organization. And there, flag states with a, an interesting tax system with low environmental uh, standards, with low social standards, um, uh, who have a lot of tonnage, uh, have a major voice. It's like small states like Liberia or like Panama or like the Cook Islands or the Marshall Islands. And that is the problem, that the international regulation is so slow and that we have um, a quite strict regulation in Europe but also in the United States if it comes to street-related um, traffic. That is um, uh, actually uh, the biggest uh, stopper for better technology and we have the technology for cars. We have a particulate filter for diesel cars. We have a, we have a, a, a catalytic system for, for diesel cars. And we could have all that for ships as well. But as long as it's not regulated, no ship owner will add that uh, to a ship or will have a new build or hardly any. There are some, uh, some cruise ships coming up having, having an SCR. Um, or using cleaner technology. There are a few cargo ships as well, but the majority of the ships, of the 60,000 uh, ships uh, uh, cruising around the world, is dirty and really very, very harmful. And you said that with the 15 largest cargo ships in the world, this is addressing actually sulfur. They are emitting as much sulfur as, um, uh, as around about 750 million cars. And if you add then as well nitrogen oxides and PM, then you get an impression or an imagination how much one single ship is emitting. One cruise ship emits as much uh, emissions, more or less, as one million cars. So if you had a cruise ship at birth here, then you get an uh, impression about the real impacts of, uh, of ships. And uh, that's the reason why we do have to have more technology, more IT to reduce that better standards in, in, in terms of shipbuilding, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Eduardo, you, you mentioned uh, in, in a similar context that from the automotive industry there has been a lot of technology available <coughs> and, and many things have been done. Yes, as a mechanical engineer, I spent 20 years developing pollution control. I had nothing to do with Volkswagen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the reality is the technology has been around a long time. And innovation drives. I can remember first shifting from automotive to the marine industry, 
and I went up to a ship owner uh, in Canada. I said, I've got a great new technology to reduce emissions. And they said, is it new? I said, yes. They said, stop. We're not interested. And that's really part of the culture of the marine industry. It's a very conservative industry. But in other industries like automotive and aerospace, the regulations drove the innovation. And we need that. The emissions from a eight-cylinder engine today are less than that of a four-cylinder 30 years ago. And the same paradigm that shocked the automotive industry, the regulations from the EPA were going to kill the automobile. What we did is we invested in the technology, and that led to development. And that's why I founded Ionata, so we could bring that technology to the marine industry and bring them to the modern industry, in the modern world, and help reduce those emissions. Mm -hmm. We have technological solutions, but to be frank, we need to mandate it through regulations, as we did with every other industry. Shipping should not get a free ride. Okay. Um, Jan Olaf, um, you also drove uh, some, some examples from, from the automotive industry and then transfer technology to there. So if you take the discussions on diesel engines in, in, in cities and, and how you uh, do that there, uh, could you see some similarities here from, from the automotive to shipping when it comes to battery and alternative drives? Absolutely, um, but what we actually uh, see, uh, you say, and I've been in the oil industry also, that if it's not proven, don't come with us with the idea, I want to have it shown. That's why I actually went to the car industry and so said, what is proven? What has been tested? What is certified and verified? And then take to the ship owners. Then they said, maybe it works. What we need are interesting incentive structures. And uh, I think Norway has trying to be some... Uh, make the new rules to have the uh, the uh, uh, NOx fund, which basically get all the ships have to pay a certain amount re regarding how much uh, NOx they emit. But it doesn't go to the government; it goes to a fund. So when anybody has a good idea how to reduce it, they can apply for the funding. So it's actually a recycling of of a cost, which then being used for innovation. And there are a number of issues like that, which I think is important. I think. Yes, the international shipping has been extremely slow. Now at the Paris Convention, finally, shipping industry has said we are committed to some uh, degrees, but uh, step by step. You have to give them a good economic reason. That's why we have been looking at the offshore industry and saying, can you actually reduce your emission, which means can you reduce your cost? And at the same time, you can brag that you were very clean. I think that's many times the right way to go. The uh, government has done something else uh, when the uh, oil crisis or the oil went terribly down, seen from a Norwegian point of view, very high up, uh, environmentally fine because then you use less from the environmental point of view. Um, they said, well, the shipping in the uh, offshore industry is really in big trouble. Nobody wanted to build any new ships. So they said, okay, we make a rule that all ferries in Norway have to be zero emission. And there are typically ferry contracts are 10 years. So we know that over the next few years, 60 ferries have to become uh, zero emission. A fantastic opportunity to really test out new technology and try it. So there we can learn again from what has happened. Sometimes I agree the American, uh, I, I used to be in the electric car business. I was CEO of something called Think, and we worked with Tesla on some projects. Uh, it's sure it's politics. But sometimes you just need one person to say, uh, uh, don't go so fast, maybe wait for four or five years with the EPA rules, and suddenly uh, you have to find other incentive uh, than uh, just hoping that the government will get the right rules and uh, requirements. Okay. And if, if you m mentioned that uh, incentivizing new innovation is, is a, is a uh, driver for, for bringing new technology yes. in, does it resonate with, with the carbon credit idea you had for, for Versley? Uh, Johanna. Yes, um, actually, um, we had in Norway a, a co-creation workshop where we invi invited uh, industry players, and um, it was called Towards Zero Emission Shipping. A lot of ship owners showed up, and they, they started to, to talk passionately about the lack of incentives to go on the green technologies. So there, there is a will, but there is a no, no monetary incentives. So that was a kind of very, very interesting support to this idea of carbon credits, that there has to be some, some new financial mechanisms to get that uh, going. Okay. Uh, Laura, you, 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 had, you took uh, the, uh, the perspective from digital technologies and you would like also to collaborate uh, with other companies and, and to accelerate in, in their way of working. If you 
being also new to the industry, if you compare it maybe from the outside, how we react in maritime in, in those areas. What has been your learning so far from, from the industry, if you, if you take that? Sure, thank you. Um, so I actually come from the startup world and um, been working, mentoring companies and working within um, innovation for, for many years. And one of the reasons um, I was brought into Maersk Tankers was because um, they were looking for a new mindset and a new capability. So what, what are the new skills that a company like Maris Tankers needs to move into the future? And how can we create a new digital department that's going to utilize technologies and these new skills and capabilities that are needed? So what I've seen is, um, I'm, I guess it's been very surprised at um, how manual the processes are done and, and Excel sheets and such that are still used. So I actually find that there's a huge opportunity here and which is the reason why I joined the company was so that um, I could be part of that change. I could be at a company that has the power to actually change the industry. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that we can do that through technology actually. Okay, thanks. And um, Malte, if, if you come back to the original problem, what, what's happening in ports and, and also in the sea, if, if, you, if you get from, from the, the other that there are some activities going on, will that be enough to make that change happen and to improve the situation? Oh, well, I think there are many options, but the problem is that the whole progress is just too slow. And uh, if we really want to do something for the local air quality issues, I mean, if you see here in Hamburg, 40% from all NOx emissions only come from shipping. We're not counting the port. The port is in addition, and then you have all the street-related uh, impacts. But 40% is only coming from shipping. And you don't feel that if you go to the north of Hamburg, which is 20 kilometers away. But you have the major impact of those 40 percents close to um, close to the river, and uh, for those people, if we don't get regulation soon, if the ports are not agreeing actually in Europe on uh, on, an, uh, on a regulation, you don't need the IMO to do that. All if all European ports between Greece and Norway would agree on certain standards, oh, not Norway, but uh, uh, Sweden, uh, would agree on certain standards, then it would not be a problem. They could agree on uh, saying, if you want to call our port, you have to have this and this and this. And, uh, but they don't, because it's always like, oh, if we do that, then we have a, a, um, a worse business position, or we, lose, we might lose freight. If we decide this for Hamburg, then our ca containers might go to Rotterdam or Antwerp. But that is always the, the, the problem, and uh, every, everybody knows the problem in terms of um, uh, climate emissions, in terms of CO2, or in terms of air pollutants. It doesn't matter. Everybody knows it, but we don't do anything because everybody always fears to lose business. And as long as we are stuck with this situation, then I'm um, quite, um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm not very confident that we will uh, improve the situation quite soon and that it will mean higher health costs for the people, higher impacts, more impacts on the environment and uh, because it's, and I say that as somebody working for an NGO, uh, it's all about business. Okay. And the Eduardo, do you mentioned also that, that uh, uh, there has been some challenges to go with a prototype to, to an operator of a vessel or something who takes the decisions. Uh, now you're also in, in, uh, in Rotterdam, I think, from within a program for an accelerator. Um, what is your experience from Rotterdam and maybe what can we take from there to Hamburg if you take Yes, uh, we're very grateful for the Port Excel. Uh, the program itself provided an accelerator. Uh, we were able to partner up with an early adopter, in this case Van Oort. Um, I, th I think the, the CEO of Van Oort, Paul Van Oort, said it very well, that companies that fail to innovate end up with really nice offices and no business. <laughs> and I think that very much sounds to me as a part of the visionary. I think we, we, we overestimate what we can do in a year and we underestimate what we can do in a decade. If we make cumulative changes today, we can have some of these technologies on board and validated. We just need also a carrot to entice some of these ship owners to adopt the technology. Okay. Yeah, of course. I mean, we don't want to have the situation what we have in China politically on one hand. On, on the other hand, the Chinese ports or the Chinese government just decided to say all ships which call the ports, uh, the Chinese ports in 2021 have to have onshore power supply. So actually you need like a 
timeline, that's what the American ports are. That's what America did as well in California, uh, especially or uh, that was uh, set in force, but also on the on the on the way, uh, on the East Coast. That you give a certain time frame for for the ship owners to um, to have an additional whatever on top of supply solution on NOx uh, reduction systems or whatever, and then it's uh, it's getting into action. And then you can say, what, what hinders one European port or the European ports to say, we want to have this and this and this standards from 2021? If you look at Norway, 2026, no cruise ships with, um, with adequate uh, abatement systems are to enter the fjords. You can say that. Why don't we do this? We are, I, I, I'm actually um, uh, resignated in terms of the uh, political speed, what we have, and uh, the, the awareness of this major problem. Just, just briefly talking about the carrot that needs to be dangled. Um, I feel like, you know, the industry, particularly the tanker industry, is. Uh, I can't speak for the industry, sorry. Um, but anyway, we are interested in innovation, and that's you know why I'm here today to figure out how what are some solutions that we can create together um, by opening up lines of conversation that perhaps were difficult in the past. And for example, currently we're reaching out across to other ship owners, um, which previously were competitors, and we're having, you know, if you can start the conversation today, then it's gonna get easier and easier in the future to create solutions together. I think you point out the, the main challenge of the le level playing field. How can we do it that everybody has an incentive? And uh, 20 years ago, I was director at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. We had exactly the same challenge for other areas. It needs some leaders who said, and that time it was ABB, today it can be Maersk, and others said, I require only this. So it can be uh, uh, Unilever, who was French before, said, this is my requirement. If the ship doesn't fulfill that, I'm not interested. And then suddenly there is a market shift that people said, well, it's a marginal investment to do that. Maybe I should anyway because I captured it. But it needs a few leaders who said, that's my requirement. And you are actually sitting here to be the right type of leaders. Can I add mm. here, um, marine industry is in, in, uh, sort of disrupted from many angles. There's a climate change, merging of new technologies, new business models the change is going to be quite drastic. And if we don't do something, we will be disrupted by somebody else coming outside from the industry. Mm -hmm. So this is the golden opportunity to do something. And it looks like the marine industry as an industry is waking up and uh, getting together because nobody can do this alone. As you say, nobody can not do something alone because uh, it, uh, this is business. <laughs> so together we can go and change the world. We have, as an NGO, uh, ran a campaign, as you've seen before, in terms of the cruise business. That's quite easy because you only have the ship owner and the customer. And we have been quite successful, at least here for the German market, which is the major market here in Europe, um, uh, three million uh, customers. And we have managed to get those three major German companies, uh, AIDA, uh, TUI Cruises, and Habergloch Cruises, to move and really to, to step forward in terms of um, uh, installing uh, technology or now, like AIDA, bringing uh, a new LNG ship, the first LNG ship into, into motion. That has really been a very great step. With the container business, it's a completely different scene because you have a scenario, because you have uh, the producer, like Nike or Ikea or, so, or whoever, and you have the ship owner or the charterer, you have the supply chain, the logistic chain, and at the end you have the customer. And if you see that you have a smartphone which is sailed around the world for 10 cents, and that is, by the way, also one issue in terms of human rights, in terms of um, um, uh, labor standards and whatever. As long as we dare to ship around goods, a T-shirt for 0 0.1 cent, uh, for this small amount of money, and we could like raise this amount for an iPhone to one euro and then collect the money and do it like a fund or whatever and give ship owners the opportunity to have better 
social standards to have better environmental standards, then that would be a system. But it's also a responsibility of you all. We heard that before. 90% of all our goods are coming uh, 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 via shipping around the world, are coming through the ports. And uh, it is also our responsibility as a customer to act and to demand that from the companies. And as long as we don't ask the companies, how is that shipped? How is it produced? Now we start slowly to look at the social standards, right? to say, oh, how is that produced in India or in, in, in Bangladesh? But we don't look, and we probably look at CO2 a little, but at the appellants we don't look at all. And that's the reason. That's awareness rising. That's what we try to do. But the process is very, very um, slow. But it also depends on you all to keep an eye on that as well and to demand that from, from those companies where you are buying. I think that works well when you have an end customer you can influence, like the cruise industry. I know AIDA is trying to market that we are clean, go to us instead of some of the other competitors. That works. But if it's the uh, community transport, I see absolutely the challenge. I had one question to you because people said that there's so much more we could do in optimizing routes, in kind of uh, using blockchain and I think to streamline the whole data flow and all thing. Can that be a direct impact on making the uh, seas cleaner? So I, I can speak about um, what we can do technologically, and um, the hope would be that it would make a big impact. I mean, it is our, our goal in order to do that, which is why we're committed to this. My, my job actually is I spend 100% of my time thinking about and working on uh, technology around bunker, the planning, the procurement, the utilization of bunker. Um, what can we do that will reduce the amount of bunker, which in turn would reduce the amount of CO2 um, emitted? So um, I think there is hope, and I think there's people doing it, and there's a lot of uh, startups that are doing it. There's other shipping companies that are working on it. And so if we can create partnerships together, I think we have an opportunity. I'd like to add to that. Digitalization can do a lot. We talk uh, a lot uh, in the industry about waste, waste in waiting times, wait, waste in routes, waste in using cargo and so on. So by, to reduce the waste, digitalization can do a lot. Um, However, it's no bo silver bullet. We have to do that and we can gain a lot, but by digitalization only we cannot um, achieve the zero emission shipping. So it has to be um, supplemented by, by green energy solutions and business models, I believe. Maybe that would be the good time to talk about our um, mechanical rotors that have just been installed on the first tanker um, vessel. Um, on the Maersk Pelican, they have been working with um, institutions and companies that have created these wind sails that are 30 meters high, and they've installed two of them on this tinker vessel, um, and this is meant to actually reduce the amount of bunker spent um, by 7 to 10% which is a tremendous amount. So we are really trying to innovate um, and create a new solution. Um, and the way it works is that, um, kind of like a hybrid car, you know, at the exact moment when uh, the conditions are right, then the, the wind um, sails would help to propel the vessel forward. Okay. One little comment, I know that maybe somebody here who were involved in the Carbon War Room, which is an initiative in different areas, also in the shipping industry. And there the idea was, can you incentivize people to install things which would reduce emission and also reduce uh, consumption? And the uh, model that time was, we'll pay for it and we'll get all the gains back. And suddenly you can be green for free even uh, because you have to be competitive. I think ideas like that, and I know the European Investment Bank is looking at similar ideas to make interesting incentives. So an investment in an improvement, which maybe has a long-term payback, but still has a payback, might be quite interesting. Okay. 
Um, I got uh, some questions from the audience. Maybe we take the time uh, for, for those. Um, one question was, is there a way to extract the CO2 out of the exhaust gas streams? Uh, there seems to be a the problem, uh, so what uh, should to solve from there? Okay. Uh, CO2 sequestering is one area my company works with. We recently signed a pilot agreement with an East Coast power plant to capture CO2. Uh, the question there is what do you do with the CO2? Uh, but there is technology to be able to remove it using amines and all liquids from uh, the plants, and we plan on applying those also to marine. Uh, just improvements in such as hull, hull cleaning, propeller, slow steaming, will only get you about 30%. We're still about 20% away from that 50% target we need to achieve for 2030. So in my opinion, we envision some sort of carbon capture being part of the marine technology mm -hmm. infrastructure. Okay. Uh, next question. New technology is great, but what about all the ships and tech that are sailing around now? It is there a mission solution for that? Yeah, you can retrofit some ships. You could uh, install an, an SCR. Um, it is not possible at every ship because it depends on the space inside. Um, uh, but it, in, indeed, it's difficult. And as we have in such an increase of newer ships uh, during the last 10 years, which will be in operation for the next 20 or 25 years, the major amount of the fleet is comparatively new. And that's the reason why we see it a little critical that there will be not so many new build ships in the future. Of those, some will be better than those which are in operation. But that's the reason why the, why, the, why the change won't be that big in the near future. And that's the reason why you have to incentivize. Ports can do that as well. For example, here in Hamburg, they, uh, they give a reduction on the port use uh, for uh, if you do something on the NOx side, uh, then you get, if you have installed an SCR, you get a reduction. It is not that much really to boost this um, uh, 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 this progress, but it at least something to show that you can do something. And if you would have like 20 ports in Europe uh, doing uh, uh, installing systems like that, then you might incentivize and make it more attractive to the ship owners. But uh, I doubt that this will be a big uh, progress. One idea we are exploring in um, in all ships is to use a combust combustion e engine, but with uh, alternative fuels. Mm -hmm. So it's um, relatively easy to introduce methanol or ammonia, for example, which are already much uh, cleaner fuels. Okay. Uh, further question: To draw a comparison with the financial sector, why regulators can't threaten the shipping companies with large fines if they don't try to be cleaner? Okay. It's not clear how to measure it and how to police it and then how to tr keep track on emissions. I think the police information. I mean, you don't have to. Um, do you ha don't have to measure NOx. You just can. You just look at the engine, then you know how much it emits in, in the end. Um, so actually, you have to measure some other things, but um, mainly you can. You just have to collect data, and I think the big, uh, big challenge is also for 2020. We have a sulfur cap um, globally to 0 0.5. And uh, I think the biggest ch challenge will be to control um, who is complying to legislation then. It is already difficult at the moment. We have these sulfur emission control areas here in North and, and Baltic Sea, and not all the ships are complying. So we are still in a progress or in process of uh, actually installing also like digital systems to see who uh, uh, who is complying with legislation. That is, uh, that is all already a challenge. You can have a good legislation, but if you don't um, uh, force or enforce it uh, the right way, then uh, good legislation is not good enough in the end. Okay. So one, one final question. Uh, to reach the uh, IMO targets, technology to meet these requirements needs to be available in the next 10 years um, of a life cycle of 25 years. Is that realistic? Okay. Uh, so <laughs> well, Probably it will be difficult in terms of CO2. That's, a, that's still a problem, uh, the uh, 20, 50, 50% 50 reduction. But in terms of um, other 
um, uh, pollutants like sulfur globally, you can sail with, uh, with MDO, with uh, uh, marine diesel oil that has 0 0.1, what you have to have in European pots already, so it is available. You can install in terms of NOx uh, uh, SCR, catalytic system, and if it would be demanded as well, you could also have a particular filter. There are companies who are producing that, but they say we could do it, but as long as there is no company who demands it, uh, we, are not, uh, we are not doing it. It's not, it's not trivial. It's really more difficult for a bigger ship. It's, let, it's a different thing if we do it for a car where you have 100,000 cars where you have a small particulate filter in it. But okay. if, so, if, if one company would start, we have talked to major shipping companies about the question, if we would have one ship installed with all possible abatement reduction systems, with a SCR, with a particular filter, if, we, if, if probably companies also would come together. We have talked to major uh, international companies and we didn't manage, we have not been successful, which was unfortunate because if we could show that we have one ship which has the optimum abatement system available today, then we would have already or could have already a clean shipping today. But as long, and you could also mix, you could mix it with batteries, you could mix it with, with, uh, with fuel cells, you could you have uh, uh, you, with sails, there's so many options already and you could plug that to one ship and that would be clean already. Okay. As said, uh, we have already technology to go f uh, to 75% down. So achieving 50%, it's really um, a question of will and uh, to mm -hmm. for that will it's like, uh, the regulation which helps a lot but also I think uh, some pressure from from the people. Uh, it's interesting how to go to zero percent percent and I'm looking forward in the next 10 years to see hydrogen develop so that we could really achieve zero, zero emission. Mm -hmm. I like, I like the idea of making a demo which knows everything because politicians have the tendency to say, yeah, that's a good idea, but it's not there yet. You can't see it. If you say, well, go there and see, this ship has this, this, this together, and it works. So I think that's a good idea, make a, a joint ship. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I'm just going to give you my card. <laughs> <laughs> Good. It's a note. Thanks a lot. That's nice. It's a note. We has have to come to an end, please. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, thank you for our planet. Thank you very much. It was m very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. I know it's frustrating that the technology is there and we can't use it, but we will, I'm sure. So we have a, a, a 30 minutes with of coffee break. You can go downstairs, round floor.